So I want to talk a little bit about the C++ core guidelines. And I wonder who of you has actually taken a look at the C++ core guidelines. So you're all experts now, most of you. I hope I don't bore you, but I also will want to show you some of the uh, things that we already developed as checkers and quick fixes for your code base. The biggest question is, if you look at core guidelines, that's just, a, let's say, I generated a PDF from the uh, website at a reasonable font size, maybe slightly big, but it ended up being more than almost 400 pages. I wonder what's core there. <laughs> that's, that's a bit of a pity. It's, it's a lot of stuff in there. And I will, many good things, but also some things that might need some discussion. And, and uh, uh, so that's, that's why uh, I'm here today. Also, the word guideline. Somehow, what does it actually mean? Is it guiding you to be very, very fast? Is it holding you back like it, a dog leash? Or is it even giving you a very narrow path to navigate? So that's, that's also something uh, it's always it's a little bit hard to understand. And depending on where you are, especially with your code base, you might feel either way or all three of them. What's actually core guidelines? I believe the, the biggest thing is what you see there, that pink elephant, my symbol for undefined behavior. It tries to keep your code away from undefined behavior and from dangers where maybe not undefined behavior you have today, but maybe tomorrow after a small change of your code base. And another thing is a lot of C++ code that exists today was written in the 1990s or before 2011, or before the Visual Studio compiler actually supported C++11, more or less. And that code is no longer considered good C++ in many situations. And even then, you could have written good C++, but most people weren't trained what good C++ is, or modern C++. So, who of you is using pointers regularly, naked pointers in their code base? Who would like to get rid of them? Who is using new, explicit calling new, not placement new, new? Delete? Oh, you should feel ashamed. Um, some of the C++ core guidelines have the intent, okay, there should be an static analysis tool under the hood that will actually slap your fingers when you violate them. And some of the uh, mechanisms that are provided actually only work when you have a static analysis tool that slaps your fingers. So that's something uh, to keep in mind. Unfortunately, we don't have a full set of all static analysis tools available for every platform to actually guarantee that you support the core guidelines. And also some of the guidelines themselves are very hard to actually automate. It's more a philosophical thing or something that is very hard to actually mechanically analyze. So the philosophy behind the core guidelines is what I try to teach my students as well. Express intent in the language, not in comments. I have, a, a, let's say, you can cite me on something where I say, only the code tells the truth. And as a, a addition to that statement, comments lie. So a lot of, let's say, modern good software engineering practices like good naming are in the core guidelines. But how do you check if a name is good? Even what a good name is might change over time when the system evolves. You might learn better what it's represents or you might need to refactor things. And some names are very hard to change even if they are wrong because they are just used everywhere. Another thing that's often forgotten is, OK, especially I would say I'm guilty of creating CS graduates, and they might learn so much, many things about algorithms and data structures. So the first thing they do when they have a job, they implement their own lists, linked lists, because pointers were so hard to understand. So better we, we do it right. And that's not the way you program in C++, because you have a, a rich uh, <coughs> library, not only of containers, as in many other languages, but also of the algorithms to use. 
Also, we have a very a quite an interesting and strong type system. We can actually put names on abstractions and we shouldn't actually use ints and doubles and floats everywhere. And I'm working towards that. Some of you might have recognized that I was working towards the a standardized unit library this week and library in a week. And it's still, but still, even if we don't have that in the standard, you can use things that provide that. So type safety, compile time checking, and no runtime errors, at least at, as long as you can prevent that, at least no undefined behavior and no leaks. For that, the core guidelines also come with a, a library that evolved over the past years, and I might not even have uh, seen the latest version of that. It provides RAI abstraction, where I'm working also on for the standardization, but it's very hard to get a simple thing like RAI into the standard. I'm a, a, roughly in the eighth or ninth iteration of the paper. And we have uh, some safe narrowing conversions, contract support, which might come in the language for C++20, span, which is also on the road for 20, and other things. And GSL is a good thing, it's header only, but I learned even with header only libraries, you should do CMake this morning. That's a slide I use, it's very hard to see. It's almost a face if you squeeze your eyes. It's a, what's in there, well, Sidestep loop statements, use algorithms on the nose. No special member functions. Curly braces for initialization. Use algorithms or reuse algorithms. Write unit tests and use auto or type deduction. Who writes a destructor regularly? No worry. Good. Who writes assignment operators? Nobody. Oh, few. Okay. Just to give you an example, uh, yeah, a little bit cut off, but I, I just so one is uh, the rules are grouped and come with a number and and some kind of uh, prefix like es is for expressions and statements, and ES number one is prefer the standard library to other libraries and to handcrafted code. So for example, you might see, well, it's a bit cut off, but use accumulate or even arrange accumulate when we get it instead of handwritten loops. And I train my students to actually to solve a lot of problems without loops during the first semester C++ course. And I sometimes get very interesting solutions I wouldn't even have thought of. So, or other things like, okay, always end a non-empty case with a break. And that's something you can actually check for. And this is a screenshot of the checker. You might not be able to read it, but it, it, it suggests to you to add a break statement. And if you press control one, it will actually, or if you press return, when you have that open, it will actually add that for you in the right place. My take, you see, I have almost as many criticisms as positive things. The pros, it's, it fosters modern C++ style. It fosters better code, less undefined behavior. It increases pointer safety, resource management, parameter passing. And it does tell you use reference, not pointers for out parameters. Instead of uh, who of you programs against the Google code guidelines? Poor, poor. <laughs> there are very old and very bad practices in there. Um, good software engineering principles, less verbosity, common sense. Very often I recognize common sense is not that common. You only recognize it afterwards. Oh, that, that would have is nice, but doing it on your own is hard. It tries to read code of C-isms and 1990s C++. Who has written C++ in the 1990s? It provides guidelines for transforming your code and the helper library and the potential for better static analysis support. 
On the other hand, as we have seen, 300 something pages, it's just too many rules. You can't know them all. Especially if you don't agree with all of them. It's very hard to select the subset. So like, like C++ is a language where a tiny, a tiny language is about to, to, to pop out. The core guidelines are waiting for a tiny set of guidelines to pop out. And also some rules are conflicting, so they, you must prioritize them. Or it depends when you should apply them. So you not only always can, you, you might want to actually violate them. And some of the rules actually come with, OK, apply this rule first. And if that doesn't work, do, this, do it this way. Also, what I criticize, some of the rules are not, let's say, saying actually how to do it right, only what's wrong. And sometimes they only give bad examples. And if you're writing your code like that, you might not know how to do it better. And then you're lost. I shouldn't do it like that, but how? There's overlap in the rules and some holes as well. The categorization is not always clear. Oh, is it, yet, is it about an expression or is it something else, what I'm talking about? And you see expressions and statement are grouped together. So, well, we have two different things, expressions and statements. Why are they put together? Or things like interfaces and, and uh, other styles of functions uh, are not always hard. It's sometimes hard to f find a rule because it's just in another category that you were looking at. Some of the rules are OK. To make sense, you have to adapt all your code base to them. And that's what I criticize, because it's about old code. Usually old code, you have huge amounts of them. And changing throughout a large code base might be very hard, even with automated tools, because they might just not do everything perfectly correct which is very easy to be wrong in C++ just because the language and the infrastructure surrounding it is very complicated. It provides common sense, which is not always common, but that's also a negative thing sometimes. And there are also some rules that are very specialist oriented. So you should not even get there in your code base. And if you're there and use code like that, then you should actually be a specialist. And then you wouldn't need the rules. So that's some of the criticism I have. And sometimes it might just be too modern for your environment. We don't have yet, yet plenty of compilers supporting concepts and libraries supporting concepts. So you just cannot write your code using concept names and shorthand syntax for concepts. Or you might be forced to use just C++11 not 17 yet. Maybe because your certified compiler is only available in a mode for C++11. Or the libraries you're, that you're using are not compatible with something newer. Also, some of the changes in C++17 and 20 will some of the helpers obsolete. So you either use the GSL version or the standard library version. So what do you do? There's a question. Can you say more about uh, not from the top of my head. So the question was, can I give an example for the specialist rules? Uh, not from the top of my head. I'm sorry. But uh, if we have time, we can just browse through and I, I might find one. And another thing. The core guidelines try to help you to move from, let's say, doing your own pointer management or resource management and transforming that to RAI. And one means to actually help you, they are helping static analysis tools, is by marking pointers and other resource holders that you care yourself about with a, a tag template alias called owner. Owner T is just T, so the compiler just sees nothing about owner, but the intent is that static analysis tools will actually take care of that and will tell you if you have an owner there and call delete on it, that's OK. If you forget to, to release that owner in the destructor, you're doing something wrong. So ownership is more or less for 
types that do their own resource management. And on the other hand, they tell you, don't do your own resource management. So it's just a transitional thing, and it's a helper for static analysis tools that we don't have yet in general. And also, it lacks the opposite to mark if you change your large code base and you know where you should place owner and all other pointers are just, let's say, um, individual object pointers that you just use for um, accessing an object without owning it. It's very hard if you migrate a code base and add owners everywhere. If, whenever you encounter a naked pointer, you have to see, is that one that I have already checked if it's an owner or not? Or do I need to have to add owner? And that makes it hard to apply that ownership principle and the static analysis tooling incrementally. So what we, uh, I had a team of my students would uh, write a plugin that also, that actually marks every pointer and gives you the option to either add owner, O or borrow as a tag. So you can actually distinguish, whenever you see a naked pointer, you, you then know, okay, that is one I haven't considered yet marking and all the others are marked and I know what, what they uh, are for. We might have something like that opposite in the standard in the future as the um, world number smart pointer, which is currently called observer pointer, but you have seen yesterday at uh, Tony's talk that this name is not very intuitive for most of the people trained in software engineering who know the observer pattern and the observer pointer has nothing to do with the observer pattern. It's the borrower thing, so the opposite of the ownership. So since I cannot tell you about the 377 pages, I try to give you an overview of the underlying philosophy and I might repeat a little bit myself, but that's a good thing because repeating stuff makes it easier for you to remember. And the first, so there are 11 rules called P1 to P11 showing the philosophy. And again, it's about getting rid of these uh, pink elephants in your code. So the first one is express ideas directly in code. And one thing is that's important for me, comments are never compiled. Use good names, good types. If you have, uh, if you have been to Tony's talk yesterday, you have seen this code, these long functions with the intermediate, Steps, extract your code and name it accordingly. That helps a lot. If you don't follow in the trap that you have something that's called the primitive obsession smell, where you, everything that you do express in ins and doubles directly, if you have a domain, you will have abstractions in those domains and name these abstractions. In with the names are just wrappers around existing stuff and C++ allows to do so for primitive types without overhead. Do it and name these abstractions. Use, if you have something that represents a physical unit or an engineering unit, use a type for that. Now we have the, for constants you can use user-defined literals to actually mark those so you have 10 meters instead of 10, which might have happen to be meters, but it could also be feet or yards or whatever, and then you mix up and your rockets explode. And again, avoid self-written loops in favor of algorithms. Okay, I already told you that. So as an example, right, if you have the, the little g, g 9.81 meters per second squared, and we have the seconds already in our uh, standard library. Write in standard C++. That, some, that is sometimes quite hard to get to because, well, some of the compilers or plenty of those tend to be very generous. One thing to be a little bit less generous is using 
pedantic, using the pedantic options and the uh, WR and W all and extra options, so to get rid of all your warnings and your slightly misunderstandings of the standard or the generous generosity. Uh, in the past, I wouldn't, I, I don't know about the current versions, but in the past, especially Microsoft was a little bit guilty of being very generous to their programmers. And now they are bitten by that because they have to support backward compatible bugs uh, throughout the ages. I think now they are trying to get rid of those, but even then it's hard for them. But also we have a GCC who very generously provides additional features that you might not be aware of that are not yet standardized or might be standardized in a slightly different way than you use today. And so one thing is actually use multiple compilers to check your code for uh, standard compliance and use the corresponding compiler flex. Also, macros are something that's bad because a lot of things and uh, we have some means to get rid of that. Like uh, if you have a macro that is a function like macro and it could be represented by an inline function, we, can, we are actually able to transform that for you as a generic inline function so you don't lose the flexibility of the macro but get increase the type safety. Express intent, which is very close to actually what does mean express ideas directly in code. So that's where some overlap is there. Like use a range for loop or a better algorithm instead of a while loop or whatever loop you're doing. Uh, know the language and the standard library and maybe even other good libraries to use and use them. And even if you consider that for each, for each is one of the loops that I consider cheating because very often it's applied where another better suitable algorithm is available, but you're just too lazy to figure out how the, this other algorithm works. I'm not saying that for each should be uh, forgotten, especially with the um, range for it's uh, some tension, which, which should I use? And uh, again, for each is cheating try to find the better, every for each is a candidate for refactoring to a better algorithm. Static type safety. Who is using casts, whatever blend of? Every cast you are using is a potential candidate for a design problem in your code. If you have to use cast, you might just have the wrong abstractions or you're mixing abstractions or mixing representation for the same abstraction, which is not a very good idea very often. Who is using unions and not an implementer of variant? Don't. Use variant. Also, we have this legacy from C that is one of the big bad things in C++, arrays. Who's using plain arrays? Who got bitten by pointer, uh, array to pointer decay and when passing to a function? Who's using pointer arithmetic? That's really dark, bad corners. Don't go there. Get rid of those code. Use std array. Standard algorithm. For strings, you can use string view now. For conversions, one thing that's nice is use curly braces. And we provide a fixing tool for you that allows you to apply them automatically because they prohibit narrowing conversions, which is good. You don't get surprises. The only exception until C17 is don't use them if you write auto here. Especially interfaces like that where you pass a pointer and a size. Very, very bad. Problem is, 
We got them from C. Everybody who's programmed in C is used to them. So we all have to use them and live with the fact that n sometimes might not be the appropriate value to what you get as a pointer there. And this pointer might even be the null pointer. Ooh. Yeah, question? Can you refer to some literature where those problems are described in more detail? The core guidelines. Okay. <laughs> or come to my lectures. Or So the question was, where can I read about all these problems? And the answer, the core guidelines. 377 pages. With a lot of examples, so that's not, not too bad. What's that? Is that a printed book? Or? No, it's, it's a work in progress. You can download it uh, as PDF, as HTML. You can even uh, submit your own corrections to that. It's on GitHub. You missed the first two minutes. Yes. So prefer compile time checking to runtime checking. And fortunately, we have a strongly typed language with C++ that allows us to do that compile time checking. Just consider Python. You have no chance. Everything is at runtime. That's a great flexibility, but also occurs if you make mistakes and don't have good test coverage with the unit tests. Run static analysis tools because the compilers cannot do everything and use either FlexLint, PCLint, CVelop, or all the other uh, sanitizers or checkers that you can get, because each of them will check different things. There might be huge overlaps, but some corner cases can be very interesting to see them from different tools. If you write generic code or other code where you make assumptions, we now have the tool of static assert to actually check things so you can check your assumptions like asserting that the size of int is four, which might not be true on all platforms, especially if, if you program against interesting platforms like DSPs or very small or very big processors. And today we live in a world where a size of int might no longer be four, but eight. Or some software I'm guilty of that, assumes that a pointer is as big as an int or as big as a long, which is also no longer always universally true as it was in the 1990s on 32-bit processors. That's also something. We thought it would last long enough. The problem is with working software, it is in use much, much longer as you ever intended. In 1998, we wrote a tool in C++ with the name HACK, H-A-C-C. The customer told us, oh, it will run only for two years and then the infrastructure will change and we need to switch it off. But it might need to run for three years because of the year 2K problem where they had a hardware that was definitely not year 2K compatible. It will... Uh, it will, at least they wanted to get over the January 1st of 2000. That software that was intended to run two or three years is still in operation today. It's no longer has that big user base, but it's still in operation today. And it's a gateway to their mainframe and they intended to switch off the mainframe at least twice over the last 20 years and they failed. So, and that's also the software where the size of a void pointer was expected to be the size of the along. We changed the framework in between, so we now have 64-bit compatible, but it took some, some effort and that other software still runs in 32 bits. <coughs> what cannot be checked at compile time should be checkable at runtime. It doesn't say it should check should be checked at runtime. You don't want to have every index access if you're still doing indexing, which is wrong, uh, by the way, at runtime because that might make your code slow or 
every pointer check to null if you know your control flow is in a way that it couldn't be null, but then you might better pass a reference instead. <coughs> Again, the core guideline step is a little bit of hand waving around that, the explanation. So don't use pointers, use smart pointers and the corresponding factories. Uh, we might have contracts to actually provide pre-condition pre and post-condition checks. The core guideline support library provides us with macros for, for doing these checks, at least the pre-condition checks. And one example, if you use array, at least you have the chance to use the add function to get index out of bounds exceptions. I'm not saying you should write all your code like that. Your code should use ranges or at least uh, algorithms and not requiring accessing these individual elements. Catch runtime errors early. In that corner also all means of automatic testing falls. Who's writing unit tests for their code base? Very, who's not writing unit tests for every interesting piece of code? Who feels guilty when not writing a unit test? Okay. I hope there was a good overlap there. Uh, my students will actually fail to graduate if their thesis doesn't, if they program something, if they don't have test automation. Sometimes the infrastructure you're building upon might not be able, you might not be able to actually go down to every unit, especially in very complicated settings like, for example, the Eclipse framework where everything depends on everything, which is not very nice, but it happens to be there. If you write something for that, you might not be able to write a very simple unit test for a little bit more interesting piece of code that depends on the framework, but even then all things should be automated. And whenever we get a problem, like releasing a version of a plugin that doesn't quite work, it's always in a corner where it's either very hard to test automatically or where we forgot to test. Don't leak any resources. Who's suffering from resource leaks? C++ is a good language because we have deterministic garbage collection at the closing curly brace. And we have the means now, especially with uh, move semantics, to have a very good RAI implementation ability. I hope we will have scope guard and unique resource in C++ 20, but you can actually find an implementation around, and there are plenty of implementations, but getting it Working for arbitrary types is really hard. Yes? Uh, was finally a recent addition to the GSL? It might have been uh, thrown away already. I've, but I believe it's, it's there. It's yeah. fine. The question was, is finally, which is down here, a recent addition to the uh, core guideline support library? At least it's, it's a means to provide RAII. So, and I... Someone in the audience said something about it that I didn't hear. Oh, yes, it, it, is, it has been there. For a long time. Is it, yeah. is it gone? No, I don't no, think. it's there. It's there. It's there, it's there in GSL and it's there in GSL like. So. Okay, so it's finally is in the GSL and in also another incarnation. The biggest thing, no naked owning pointers and no explicit new delete malloc free f open screwed up or whatever. Is someone actually using malloc in C++? Do the malloc count? What's that? Do the malloc? Bad idea. Very bad idea. That's, that's not C++. Even using new and delete is, in my opinion, not modern C++. Use make unique or make shared if you actually do OO programming. Prefer immutable data to immutable data. We have const. Unfortunately, compared to other languages, Const is not the default in C++. 
It would be much nicer if you, we would have to write mutable, as we have to do with lambdas, to get mutability. Even, at least I believe 10 years or more ago, Stephen Tewhurst wrote, as cons as possible, but not more. Fortunately, we now have a plugin for a develop that allows you to act, that will mark your code with that nice C on the side and tell you, okay, you better should add a cons qualification here because I determined that you won't call any non-cons member function or any change, uh, or won't do any change to that variable. And it will even write it for you in the right place. Unfortunately, that change to the Eclipse CDT that puts it in the right place is currently not available. It will become available when the next CD, uh, Eclipse release comes out. But then we will be able to transform. So you will, if you do that today, you will get the cons on the left-hand side, which is wrong. There are exceptions. You might want not to uh, make a local variable cons if you use it as a return value but the consificator now is actually able to detect that and will not suggest adding const. Also, what people often forget, if you make a parameter const, and it's not a reference or pointer, that const is insignificant for its uh, signature. So if you treat that as a local variable, it's very good to make it actually const because then you don't inadvertently change it which might have interesting effects, especially if you have functions that are that long. Sometimes we need to make it our hands dirty. But if you do so, encapsulate either in a function or in a type and don't bleed out that messy code to your users. It's sometimes hard to do so, but just consider you are, have to access a C API that requires you to use pointers or gives you pointers back. Never pass these pointers nakedly along to your users. Wrap them. Either do it with a unique pointer like I showed you in the lightning talk or something else. There's a question. On the previous slide, you mentioned that placing cons in front of the data type is wrong. Uh, is that also explained in the core guidelines? Uh, it's wrong because it make, makes your types much harder to, le to read. It's not wrong syntactically. It's wrong philosophically. Yeah, but explanation of why it's syntactically uh, uh, philosophically. You always start with the, with the thing that you define, like the W here. And then you read from the inside out. If you have a complicated type construct that might be an, uh, an array of something. So if you, and if you, from the inside out beats here, here from the name to the const. So you see W is const word. If I read from right to left. No, if I read from the inside out. Inside out, but if I read in such a simple construct but if you have, uh, just consider you doing things like a pointer, which you shouldn't, but you might do that. And then it might be hard to distinguish easily between making the pointer pointy const or the pointer const, or you might want to have both. And that's very hard to read. And if you want to learn that, I consider you come to my lecture at home. Yeah. Okay, I'm not the first one to, to preach that 1999 Dan Sachs actually to tells you how to spell const and where to spell const. And all of the standard is wrong. And it's deliberately wrong because no one has a refactoring tool for the standard text. What are the other areas after the philosophical things? It's about interfaces, functions, and there's a lot of overlap. About classes and hierarchies, so that's more the OO-ish programming uh, part. Enumerations, where we have fortunately now st uh, uh, 
strong naming and not the leakage of names from an enum type. Uh, resource management, expressions and statements, concurrency and parallelism. With, I believe there was a talk today as well or yesterday on uh, non non threads, no threads in parallel code. Um, error handling, that's also an issue very often, especially if your system is inconsistent about its error handling strategy, which can be very surprising. Constants, templates, C style programming, you should just get rid of that. Source file structure, standard library, and some supporting sections. And one of the most important things is about non rules and myths. There are let's say local or other coding guidelines that tell you things that are no longer true and that might have been true in 1980, 1985, and in C maybe a little bit longer, but it's no longer true. Like who, is, who has single return rule in their guidelines? You're lucky. Or one class per source file. That's not always a good idea. I would say one abstraction per header, okay, if, or a group of abstractions that fit together, but that might mean more than just one class. Or two-phase initialization, who writes classes with an init method? <laughs> You're laughing? <laughs> who has to use code bases that have that? <laughs> it's just wrong. Full stop. And if it might have been a technique in the 1990s or early 1990s where people didn't trust the constructors and where exceptions didn't work yet in the language. But it's just wrong. Or go to exit for cleanup code. We have RAII, and soon you will have scope guard and scope exit and scope success in your st standard library. Some of the problem areas, a little bit more things again. Resource leaks. Don't program resource leaks. We have smart pointers. We have RAII wrappers. We have the concept of ownership, which I believe is just a temporary thing for you to migrate your code base to better RAII classes. If we have RAII, the unique resource in the standard library, I believe there's actually no reason to do that ownership thing again because you no longer will have naked pointers that are owning stuff. Using invalid pointers, who has ever suffered from a invalid initialized, uninitialized, or no longer valid dangling pointer? Just don't go there. Memory corruption. The only thing, well, I have to confess, a couple of weeks ago I had very interesting effects, and I was wondering why, and then I recognized that I changed the library header without recompiling the library that I linked again. Okay, bad luck, undefined behavior, wrong things, but just don't go there. Casts. You have a type system and make it your friend. Don't fight against it. It will tell you, it tells you something. If you need to write a cast, you're doing something very wrong. Bless you. Get rid of C style casts. Don't do pointer arithmetic. Use array, std array, std vector. I would say 99% of the time, or more than 90% of the time, vector is just okay. And it works. And if you are working on very specific platforms, go to John Lakers, learn about allocators, and do interesting stuff with them. In that system that I talked to you about, the, the underlying framework actually uses allocators in a way where we have threat uh, local arenas to allocate from, 
and that is something where we actually implemented our own allocators or use boost uh, stuff for that later on and that actually helped a lot in performance under multi or multi-threaded systems but you don't have to write your own calls to malloc and new or new Ownership. The core guidelines tell you, okay, you are still allowed to use raw pointers if you have a non-owning single object pointer. So no pointer arithmetic, no ownership, but it can be null. We suggest that you use another marker in contrast to owner that is named borrower but even better, just get rid of your pointers. Manage your memory with smart pointers. If you want to pass something around, use reference instead, which cannot be null. And if you actually don't know if it's there, consider using optional with the reference, right. which is more or less what, what a naked pointer provides you but with an exception if you access it, which you don't get from a pointer, if it's empty. <clears throat> we have some things where we work in the pointer area, for example, replacing an ULL with null putter, which can be more type safe on your system, uh, or changing character pointers to standard string usage, including adapting uh, calling to C string functions to string operations, and use std array instead of plain arrays, and so on and so on. And all these are opt-in, so you are not fo forced, but you can have your code marked and then get the, the fixes, can apply the fixes that will do all the changes for you automatically. Ownership, yes, and that's what was actually the topic of my lightning talk, who has not been as my, at my lightning talk, well, some of you, just a classic one is, okay, if you have a unique pointer with the free, to be free C pointer, do it like that, and I've seen several uh, website and done, uh, proclaimed it myself, okay, this is how you adapt unique pointers for your C pointers. Don't do it because then your smart pointers get too big. They have are now two pointers, the function pointer for free and your actual pointer. If you make a default free tiny class, you can actually get it, get around that and use that and then your unique pointers will actually be the same size as a plain pointer and you have the cleanup automatically. And if you have a different cleanup function than free in your environment where you have to use some C code, just do the same thing for that and use a unique pointer around all of your pointers. Do it. Take that home. If you take nothing home, do something like that for all of your pointers. Interfaces. Explicit interfaces. So make things explicit. Tell your users what they are intended to be co to call. Don't use global variables. The only place where you might access a global variable, if you would be my student, is main. And that includes standard C out, standard C in, and standard C error. If you write code that does I.O., even if it's for testing purposes only, pass the stream as a parameter. Why? Then it's testable. Every piece of code where you access a global variable, you cannot unit test. Think about that. Question? Let's assume you have this class 
The question is, how do you uh, test that a class where a class where the constructor can throw? Actually, constructors yeah, should. You, you're not testing that class. You're using that class as external dependencies. The class you are testing. If you ha have external dependencies, <laughs> come to my talk that I will submit for CppCon on mocking. Or we have support for actually. Um, Question is about external dependencies, how to test code that has an external dependency for a class that might throw. How do you mark that class? Um, go to mockada.com, that is integrated into our CVELOP uh, IDE, and there you will see how we provide code transformations to first get dependency injection with either OO features, template parameters, or through the linker or the preprocessor. And then you can uh, substitute your dependency with something else. And if it's a concrete class and you don't want to have OO overhead, you can extract the dependency by extracting a template parameter. So do we, uh, introducing a policy to your uh, class that you want to test. That's possible. And it doesn't produce overhead. And I don't want to go that to do that talk now that I uh, want to submit for CppCon. <coughs> but you can do it. So no, no two-phase initialization. Make your constructors throw if you, you cannot establish an invariant. And it's testable. No singletons. The singleton design pattern is the most unusable and most dangerous thing. And the problem is everybody knows how to do singletons because that's the simplest class diagram in the design patterns book. And everybody remembers that. Observer is already too complicated or composite. And it's just wrong. Singleton stems from an era where globals and their initialization just didn't work well. And we're still in that era in some point because we have no defined sequence of initializations across uh, compilation units in C++. That might go away with modules, but I'm not sure. And just don't use global variables that require interesting initializations and have cross dependencies. It's a bad design. If you have things that you need everywhere, initialize them in main and pass them as arguments down to your call chain. Make your interfaces strongly typed. Don't use void pointers as parameter or return types or any kind of other interesting generic types. Pre and post conditions. Specify and make a checkup that preconditions are actually fulfilled. State the template parameters with concepts and one suggestion there is write a requires clause in a comment and provide it there. But think twice if you actually need a specific concept or not. Because sometimes a more generic solution is actually better than a too limited solution. Use exceptions. I know there are areas where exceptions are prohibited. But if you're, let's say, writing normal code, exceptions are your friend. Don't transfer ownership on raw pointers, but since you no longer use raw pointers, but unique pointer. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Is it my computer or should it be? <coughs> There's a not null template in the GSL for non-nullable pointers, but consider instead of passing a not null pointer, why not use not null at the call side and pass the reference to your function? If you have an API 
or defining an interface that requires a pointer or to something that must not be null, better use a reference. Unless you are forced to program against the Google coding guidelines. But even then, I would object to them. Yes? The interesting thing about it is that it does checks at both compile time and at runtime. Yes. So, I mean, that, that's a nice feature if you're trying to get things out. You cannot pass a null pointer to, to not null, either at compile time or even at runtime. So that's, that's a good thing. But again, better not needing that. So it's all a transitioning thing like the ownership thing. No array decay. Don't write interfaces where you accept a pointer and an, a length. Just don't force your user to do that. Use either detection of the length in, with the template parameter, or just pass std array by reference, or accept iterators. Just don't do, or better now in the future, ranges. Few parameters per function. Who is using the Windows API? <laughs> when Windows 1.0 came out, my then boss got a book of, of the Windows API. I was already teaching Unix programming then, as, still as a student. But I looked at that API and I said, that violates every rule I give my students as a teacher of C. And it still is the same. More than three parameters of a function is potentially dangerous. Maybe in some corner cases, four is just something you can live with. But there's lurking an abstraction that's missing. So stick to few parameters. Therefore, I don't believe that named parameters are really a good idea, because then people start out and writing long parameter lists again. Don't do it. If you have unrelated parameters of the same type, something like, oh, do it, and I have three flags to pass in what actually should be done. That's worse. I've seen one API, but I could actually get the people to change it that used the tuple of bools, <laughs> which is even worse. <clears throat> if you do OO-style programming, use abstract classes as interfaces to hierarchies. And the only thing is where you actually live on a platform where you provide infrastructure libraries that are used from different compilers. There you might actually have to stick with the cross-platform ABI. But there was a nice talk by Stefanos Dutois, I believe CppCon 14 or 15, that's on video about Hourglass interface. And you want to learn how to do that, look, look this talk. Function rules. And you see, it gets messy and too small to read. There are just too many of them to, to uh, go into the details. And class hierarchies, I point out a little bit. I'm not always a fan of a lot of OO stylish programming because it just doesn't fit so well with C++ today. But for example, things like, OK, a class usually might have helper function because it is, a, it, it is an abstraction and there might be function that take this class as a a parameter type, then put those functions in the same namespace for, like as the class because of ADL. Who does not know what the abbreviation ADL in the context of C++ means? Good. I have seen nobody. That's very good. Argument dependent lookup for the viewers of the video. Minimize the exposure of members, make them private unless they are const, that you might consider actually allowing access to them. There are subsections like sections on how to define constructors, what to do with assignment operators and destructors. And my take is don't do assignment and destructors yourself. Rely on the compiler generated ones. They are just right. And if they aren't, then your code is wrong and your member variables are wrong. And just don't use unions, unless you're implementing variant. 
and that is done for you. Don't do it yourself, because it's really hard to get it right. Even to get the standard wording right is really, really hard. And there are people who believe we still got it wrong with 17. Default class operation. That includes the rule of zero. I would say ignore what's there. Just write your classes in a way that you don't need to specify the default copy constructor, copy assignment, move constructor, move assignment, or destructor because the compiler will generate them for you correctly if all your member variables are defined correctly. If you have the urge to define those special member functions that the compiler will generate for you, you're doing something wrong in your code. Go to your code base, look at it, and get rid of them. Resource management. My take is use smart pointers if you need resources allocated on the heap that you manage yourself. But consider vector and string just work well and do everything for you. Naming and layout. Don't say in comments what can be clearly stated in code. I claim every comment you need to write tells you that something is wrong with, you, with your code and you should refactor it. If your code is non-understandable without comments, try to refactor it so it becomes understandable without comments. The first comment says only the code tells the truth. Comments are not compiled. I say that again. Comments are not compiled. And they are just wrong. State intent in comments is a rule in the core guidelines and say use better names. Then you don't have to state your intent because it's obvious. Keep comments crisp. No comments needed. That's what I read there. The best comment is that that you don't have to need to write to make your code understandable. Maintain a consistent indentation style. I learned from Tony yesterday, oh, it doesn't have to be that consistent, as long as it's somehow reasonable. And again, an IDE will make it nice for you if you mess up. And usually the messing up comes from copy-pasting, which is also a bad idea. Don't encode type information in names, because that may, might make you reluctant to change it, and that also, if you change it, you might forget to change all the names. Unfortunately, Microsoft is guilty, Hungarian notation, like starting every pointer with P or every class with C, not very good. Or every struct with S, which is ridiculous, because class and struct is exactly the same except for the default visibility. Nevertheless, use a consistent naming style. Use all caps for macro names. Better get rid of all your macros. And we have a tool for that. I told you the macronator not only will help you getting function-like macros into context functions, but it also will allow you to detect if you have unused uh, defines and get rid of those. And if you have some interesting defines that you, it cannot transfer, uh, transform automatically, it gives you the option to individually inline the macro, expand the macro, and it's gone. You cannot change it anymore, but then you might have opportunities for refactoring your code to get rid of the, the need for the macro. Avoid camel cases, and that's also a corner where we might end up, we have some ideas about not doing concepts in camel case like the ranges TS does and not having concepts set special at all. But I'm not sure I will have uh, find someone actually listening to me about that. Use spaces sparingly. Use Kerning and Ritchie derived layout with the braces and uh, whatever. And don't use void as an argument type. That is C. That's the way how to do it in C++. Who's using void as an argument type? Good. Constants. 
make objects immutable. Unfortunately, because of our C legacy, this is not the default. Make member functions const. That often occurs in old code bases where people just didn't care. Especially because temporaries can be used to call non-const member functions, which is somehow odd because you cannot pass them by reference. But if you will call a member function, they actually pass by reference. <coughs> Today we have means to actually mark our member functions with a ref qualifier, which prohibits that they are used on temporaries. Just consider, is something actually mutation? Then accept the reference. Sometimes it's convenient to mutate a temporary, but that's not always a good thing to do. If you ever have to pass pointers, pass them as cons as well as references, unless you deliberately want to actually have an out parameter that actually gives you a return value. But that's no longer that necessary. We have structured bindings now. So if you have more than one result, just pass everything together as a struct or tuple or whatever and unpack it on the receiving side. Use const whenever you define something that is not changing after construction and even const expert for things that have to be computed at or that can be computed at compile time. Unfortunately, we recognize as more const expert code that we write, especially in generic code, we have the curse that const expert is not the default. Because they, those functions usually are pure and it might be nice to have more pure functions. And we have the rules one to four are actually implemented in CVELOP and you can actually, you get these little C's and you can add the cons qualification automatically. And I will show you soon. What's in the support library? We recognize we have owner and not null. We have the contract stuff and expects and ensures. We have a util part of the core guideline support library. Whenever you name something util, it's a very bad name. It means, oh, I haven't considered a better name and I uh, was too lazy to come up with a useful naming name. So whenever you see the name util, read, okay, this needs renaming. Very often it packs together very badly, completely unrelated stuff. Like, what does a narrowing has to do with scope guards? Nothing. What does an add checking array index access function for std arrays and plain arrays have to do with narrowing or scope guards? Util, bad name. We have span and string span. String span is almost like string view which we get in 17, C++ 17, but it allows read-write access. But I believe in the, uh, for C++ 20, we will only get span, not string span. And in the early versions of the core guideline support library, there was even a, a Z, Z, Z string span and a Z string span for uh, whatever things Microsoft uh, has in their code base. And uh, unfortunately, that got, uh, is, is gone. We might get, well, in 17, there was proposed array view and string view. We didn't get array view. We have view. I'm not sure if that's in 17 or in the library fundamentals TS. Need to check that. Does anybody know? Stood view? That stood experimental view? Not yet. Okay. Look it up. You learn something from it. Okay. When I prepared the slides, that what was one of my student team actually have implemented and you see a lot of numbers in the rules and things like avoid conversion operators, avoid redundant default operation and see that's all class related things and all individual checkers that provide warnings for you in the IDE and most of them actually provide also 
a fix for you where automatically the code is adapted. Can you also silence them? Yeah, each, all of them or individually. And if you ha uh, and one of the fixes is always add the corresponding GSL attribute to f to ignore it from then on. So you can individually mark either uh, switch off the the, the uh, check or mark your code that you deliberately violate that check. Even before the core guidelines came out. My goal was to get you tools for writing better code. So we have plugins already in place that serve some of the purposes the core guidelines uh, checkers do. Like we have a plugin called Ele Elevator for C11 for, uh, improvement, like getting rid of the null macro, replace uh, replaceable default. I I'm not sure what that does. Uh, Replace type devs with using aliases, which can, can make your code quite better readable. We have a whole bunch of using uh, alias-related uh, refactorings, uh, like use if you use using namespace, like using names with std, and you might get into name clashes. You can actually uh, inline that using namespace std and have all the names that come from that namespace qualified or whatever namespace you're using. It's not uh, related to a specific namespace. We have that char wars plugin that actually tries to substitute C strings and, and array, plain array, C arrays, and std string and std array. Uh, I'm planning to have next semester a team, but I'm not sure it's always a gamble if you get the students or not to get to change the char wars to actually uh, use string view instead of stand standard string, at least provide the option for that. Uh, but it's not done yet. We have the macro elimination, where you actually have a function style macro that you can might be able to transform to a cons expert function, detect unused macros that are not used, so you can actually delete that, and uh, other things. And we have for who's doing embedded software. You might have the need to actually have fixed width integer uh, types. Do you? Like int 32t. But you might have a code that just says int. And we have a plugin for that that allows you to actually individually mark all these non-qualified integer types and change them, and also the opposite because you might change the, the, the processor that is now 32 instead of 16 or 64 instead of 32 and change that back to the, let's say, the normal sizes again. And a lot of other refactorings that are in there and refactoring, let me say, in 2005 I started out and said, I want to have C++ refactoring an IDE that does it. Everybody told me you're insane to try, to even try. Just you need to be persistent. It's very hard to do every case correctly, but we are not scientists to have the uh, theoretical foundation correct, we're just engineers. So our toolings work in many cases and we don't care if they don't work because you always have the back button or control Z to, to get the previous version if something actually breaks. and you. For most refactorings, you get a preview, so you see what the refactoring would be doing. And it's more what, than what you get from uh, Clang Tidy and other things. We usually only have very local changes. We have refactorings that do uh, do more non-local changes, like extracting a template parameter from your code, either function or a class, to get dependency injection at compile time, so you can test things uh, where you have concrete classes as dependencies, just as an example. Now, let me show you s some code examples. You see we have here, a, that's th synthetical test cases, but we, you see you get a list of all kinds of core guideline problems there. And just take a look what's here, that little yellow box says, okay, a value like type should have a swap member function and there's more in there. Okay, 
we can we can say okay I don't want to have a, a, a a swap member function, so I set the ignore attribute and I will get the GSL suppress attribute there that tell, tells us not to have that swap. But there's another problem here. Okay, we need a destructor because we have an owner in our member variables. Unfortunately, yeah. So we can just add a destructor with the delete statement to that class, if I get it right or not. That's now showing stuff. Let's go to the next demo. Here we have a whole bunch of the cursor. Come on. Okay, destructor should be no except. Let's see if that change actually works. Okay, that works. And a move constructor. Should also be no except. Make it work. Other things. Oh, casts. C style casts are very bad, but even others are bad. Because a C style cast, you don't know what cast you actually want to have. Oops, wrong cursor position. And now we have the option to either use a static cast, a dynamic cast, which would be wrong, a const cast, which is also wrong, or reinterpret cast. Or ignore it. So we just change it to a static cast and are happy. But we see another problem here. We use a variable for completely unrelated purposes. A good functional programming style has single assignment variables, so they could be const. And this is a variable that actually changes. And if you have something like that, it's always very often an indication that you're reusing a variable for something else. And that's something you cannot fix automatically because you might just want to use it another variable or you're reusing loop variables, which is not very good. Now, character arrays, that's something I need to show you. Getting rid of these things, and it will actually do the same stuff with the corresponding string functions. Cool, huh? See? Strucat. And that's it. And even that reserve is actually superfluous, but it corresponds to the 100 spaces that you have in your array before. Or other things like, oh, I have character arrays and use them wrong and override my stack frame. And let's see if I compile that and try to run it. I'm not sure I'm hitting the right menu with a very large pointer. That's my problem. Yeah. I see that something strange happens, that my secret is no longer secret, but one, two, three, four, five, six. And if I change that code to actually employ my strings in both cases, it should just, oh, I get a problem because that string, oh, that wasn't a uh, change to a string. Ah. I still have the problem here that I get an out of bounds access. Okay. What else? Real world code. Question? When replacing arrays like this with std strings, it is not guaranteed that some part of the flute will be keep our data, right? Where, whereas the array is always on the stack. Is always on the stack. 
Yeah, that's the difference. That's why I want to get uh, the string view refactoring. So the question is, this might be on the heap and no longer on the stack, and this, uh, with, if you change that to the string as well, it might also be something changing where the string is stored. And uh, the answer is, that's why I want to change that uh, plugin to also support string view, which we hadn't that uh, available when we wrote that plugin. Well, the string view will actually give you the pointer plus the length, and you have the, the range check when you use it. But you cannot actually, but this wouldn't be a string view because there you actually don't initialize, so you don't uh, uh, have the, the situation with that. Yeah? I think uh, the string secret is also on the stack. Uh, the but isn't that, that guaranteed? Like small string optimization, that size? Uh, but you cannot, you don't know. It's not guaranteed. It's only by chance. It's possible, but as I know, it's not guaranteed by the standard. It's not guaranteed by the standard. But just give you another impression of what, that's from the fish shell, which is an interesting C++ uh, test case for us because it comes with some unit tests or with some test cases and it has enough of C-ish code to actually give you some interesting things. Like here we have a, a very interesting type dev, and let's see if I can show off. I can actually change that to using alias, and you get a preview to actually see what would change to so have the using and what actually the code will look like. Oops, I just apply it and we now see, okay, the type defined is called expand stage and it is a function pointer with these parameters. And you see, we even try to keep the comments around. That is a very hard part when you use writing IDE with refactorings. <coughs> um, maybe we find some, I've already shown you the cast problem here. Oh, we have, a, a, a again, array size comes as a, a parameter and it's cast to a long. Huh? Why is then this size not just size t? But at least we provi can provide you with a static cast so you see that's the cast. I think one of the reasons is this function is very long and that size variable is actually might actually be used somewhere else in a different uh, context. And you see the cast of array size too long is, is again something somewhere else. And here we compute something where we co uh, the result is along and we have the operator and their size is along. Yeah. You see there are interesting pieces in the code or variables that use the assignment as the initialization, we can actually replace that with curlies and guarantee that we don't have narrowing there. Guarantee that we don't, we don't have what? Narrowing. Oh, Curly okay. braces prohibit narrowing. Or uninitialized, ooh. At least what we can do is this. But that's wrong now because the cons is no longer uh, uh, working because we initialize with a null pointer and it's assigned later somewhere else. So back out that. Why, 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 why does it complain that the cons is placed in, some, in front of its type? Well, because this version of the IDE doesn't have the patch where your cons should be on the other side. Because that requires getting into the guts of Eclipse CDT and that area actually changed from the previous version of CDT and our patch no longer worked and we needed to actually contribute it to CDT and it only will come in the next version of CDT. That's why we currently don't, well, we currently, if we, for example, this says, okay, you could make it const. Oh no, that's not, let's see if we can find a const check. Yeah. 
you see, arrows is only red, so the pointer is never changing, and it will allow us to write const here. And that's where it actually goes in the right, right thing, because this pointer is actually a reference to a single object and not an array where you don't have array or arithmetic, yes? Will it put the double const in for, for things that it sees or just the, the single const for the context? It will do whatever it can detect. So if it detects that you pass error list as a type where you don't call any uh, non-const member function and don't change anything that might be uh, 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 any uh, non-const member, then it will also suggest to add const there. It tries very hard. There have been some false positives, but I think we eliminated most of them. And now let's see to wrap up. Core guidelines can help you migrating older C++ to modern style. There are tools around not only ours, but ours as well. That's why I'm here also. And uh, they assume static analysis, Microsoft integrated Clang anal Analyze to achieve that in, in demos, and they also have it now for Visual Studio, but I haven't tried that, so I cannot tell you how well that works. Anybody tried that? It's better than I expected. <laughs> yeah, but with Clang, you have the, the, the benefit that uh, uh, you have a real compiler front end, and the disadvantage that you have a real compiler front end. Because with macros, it might get interesting. Um, some areas need cleanup, some guidelines could be disputed with all kind of guidelines, uh, curation and editing is required and some rules take care of really old stuff and you better should not, not even go there. If you have code bases like that, you have other problems. Uh, but I believe in some areas, Microsoft did a, a uh, walk through a lot of, uh, of their existing code, which is huge, and a lot of C++, and they might have dirty things everywhere. And I believe every, every piece of dirt they found in their code base, they actually wrote a guideline for, which is okay, but which might not be the best thing. And we have some checkers and Visual Studio as well, and you might find other IDEs with more checkers as well. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I don't see the JetBrains people anymore. I believe they left. You should, you should have asked them. And remember, no special member functions, no new and delete, use algorithms, no loops, if you can uh, prevent them. And now we have 30 seconds for questions, but we don't have anything tonight, so feel free to ask me anything. And before I, I answer them, before you go, when you go out, pass up here in the front and take your chocolate because you suffered from me for 90 minutes, and if you are interested in what we provide with CVELOP, you can take a flyer and read about it. Now, uh, let's start here. Uh, just a quick one. So, uh, CVELOP is how much for Eclipse, or is it standalone? Or how it it's, it's standalone based on Eclipse CDT, working on all kind of platforms where you have Java. So the question is, where does CVELOP run? Everywhere. Uh, the question is, do, we, do you do any lifetime checking? No, because that's hard and that requires much more aliasing in C++ is a curse and you better have code that doesn't rely on it or use it. Does yes? develop tweak the JVM default memory settings so that I don't run out of memory trying to end my <laughs> um, Yes, and you have a pro if you have a problem, ask us, we tell you where to fix it. It comes with huge memory settings, otherwise you might get into problems. If you have very large problems, if you have problems we are around, just ask us and we help you. Yeah? Is it for free and does it have any licensing limitations? It is for free, but not everything is open source. And the, the question is, is it free? Yes. If you want to, it, it, uh, most of it comes with the Eclipse license, but we have plugins that we don't release open source, at least not under Eclipse license because a lot of Swiss taxpayers' money went into it, and I have to pay my assistants and sometimes my students, and I want to, and I need to get some external funding for it. So most of what is now in CVELOP was financed by, let's say, 
money I got from the school and from the EU. And I'm happy to provide commercial licensing for people who want to pay for it. It's just not, I cannot make it, let's say, pay $10 because we don't have any micropayment facilities at our university. And the lowest bill I can give you is 500 Swiss francs because below it costs more to, 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 to make the bill and, and, and uh, the processing. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we give it away for free. What is in dollars? 500 dollars. It's one to one. So, so do, you have, do you have a CMake integration? If you don't, because I know it's a user scum, is, is there a way to use this without it stepping all over my CMake? Um, let's say Eclipse CDT as of today has its own view of the world, what a project is. And it's not like C Lion using CMake files directly. I plan to have it next year, uh, next semester, a, st a student team working on that integration. The problem is I, I tried to do that two years ago, and then the CDT people told me, well, we are changing everything and we will support CMake, and it never happened. And now I have to, to try again to find a student team. And I, I learned that uh, Daniel is coming to Switzerland and he might actually help me and, and consult our students on CMake. I would love to. <laughs> because it's not that easy. But uh, at least CMake allows you to generate Eclipse project files that you can in, uh, uh, use and in, uh, load into CVELOP. So there's at least the one way. And we learned you should write your CMake files by hand anyway. Any more questions? And if you're eager to want something and want the source for it, just ask. It's just, I, the Eclipse license is just in a way that, you, that people can take it and sell it as their own. And that's what I want to prevent. That's why not everything is open source. Uh, so you, you don't uh, provide the source code, but you can install those plugins. You, you just can use it. That's free. Free to use, but not free to change. And I'm not Stallman. <laughs> and uh, considering the money, we, we spent more than a million Swiss francs over the past 10 years on that. That's K about 500,000 K from the EU and the rest from other profits and other money we got from the university. And profits we made from consulting and other projects. So we're more or less working like a consulting company sometimes from my institute. And you see, we have fans out there. Someone who actually filed a bug and still was very happy with it. So try it. And if you have problems, ask. And for those of you who want to use Swift on a non-Mac platform, we are working on that. We have an IDE called TIFIC, tific.net which is not as far as CVELOP, but we're on our way. And some features of TIFIC are there with code navigation that Xcode doesn't provide or cannot provide to you. Many of Xcode features we don't have, but some navigation features we have that Xcode cannot provide or doesn't provide correctly. Like for example, you can actually see the implementation of a standard library piece if you just control click on that which you can't do with Xcode. There's another question. Sorry, I can't see everybody. If someone wants to ask something, wave heavily so I can see you in the dark. In the presentation you mentioned uh, talk about allocated tissue crush. Um, I Googled it on Nathan's or something, but I couldn't find it. So there was one here, here this week. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, other ones at other locations. Overlooked. Yeah, if you... Google John Lakers and on YouTube you will find some talks on allocators, but not yet the one of this week. But there's Boost Allocator, I believe. Is, is that the name of the library? Where are the Boost people? Yeah. Where you have Pool Allocator and things like that. And yeah, so there is Boost support for special purpose allocators. So, and John Lakers is good. Come next year if he's here again and watch him. Or it's maybe he also comes to CPPCon. Could be. Other questions?
Don't forget your chocolate. Take your CVELOP cards to remember where to download it and flyers if you want to learn more that I didn't tell you. And don't forget your chocolate. And thank you for saying that one. <laughs>